Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Hernando Church of the Nazarene and the somewhat limited version of our Wednesday night service. My name is Hal Whittett, and I'll be here tonight because Pastor Andy is in Boston, and he's going to come down, I think, tomorrow. We're going to leave with his daughter to travel down here to Hernando so that she can visit for a couple of weeks. So you got the JV team in tonight. We're limited this evening because actual warm bodies are somewhat in short supply. Uh, two of our members have recently come down with the COVID-19 virus. So out of an abundance of caution, we have pretty much shut our doors until Monday, the 31st of this month. That's the time that we intend to reopen, but we'll keep you posted as to the actual date, depending on how things unfold as we go along. Until that time, I hope you will continue to tune in to our services at their regular times uh, so that we can continue to worship as a body of believers while being appropriately socially distanced. That's very important. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to give everyone an update on our financial condition of the church. I'm sure some of you have questions, uh, concerns about how things are going, so here's your opportunity. As you probably know, all churches have experienced a decline in tithes and offerings over the past few months, and probably more than a few will have to close their doors permanently due to lack of funds. But God is faithful. We're doing okay. Like most other churches, our tithes and offerings have dropped off significantly, but we have not yet had a month when our expenditures exceeded our income. Our tithes and offerings have always covered our expenses. That is to say that every, every month, our, tithe, our expenses have been paid, including our general church and district obligations, our World Evangelism Fund obligation, and our district fair share obligations are paid in full, and we still have a positive cash flow. So we need to thank you for that and your faithful giving. I want you to know that we are keeping a careful watch over our expenditures to be sure that our, our cash outflow is under control. So please be assured that we're being the best stewards that we can during this difficult time for everybody. A real blessing is that we have several thousand dollars that have been held in reserve. So should we experience any shortfalls over the coming months, we do have a cash cushion that we can tap into if we need to. And that's all because of your faithful giving over the years. So we truly appreciate that. So as your church treasurer, I thank you for your faithfulness. And I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you to continue giving faithfully. And while we're not meeting here, uh, please consider giving through our church website, hernaz.org, or send your check here to the church at the address that's listed on the website, hernaz.org. Thank you very much. Crystal, come and lead us in worship. I'm going to start us off with a song that we did a few weeks ago that says, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. And uh, several of you commented back about how you hadn't heard this song, but you loved it. So we're going to do it again for you. And I'm so grateful that he paid a debt that I could never have paid. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I could not Wash my sins away And now I sing a brand new song Amazing grace all day long Christ Jesus paid a debt That I could never pay My debt he paid upon the cross He cleansed my soul from all its strong He didn't give to 
Because of that, I want to let my light shine for him. Amen. So let my life be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fall. Spreading cheer everywhere to the sad and the lone. Let my life be a light to some soul. Let me live that we could be a light as a disciple. And we want God to have his way in our lives, even though we may not understand what that is. If we trust in him and say, Lord, have your way in my life. Have thine own way.
absolute sway filled with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me have thine own way Lord if that were the only prayer we prayer tonight we prayed tonight that would be meaningful of itself let's look to the lord in prayer just now and i'd ask that those of you who are watching at home that you also would bow in prayer and let's all join together as one heavenly father we come before you with humble hearts tonight as we thank you for the privilege of gathering together in the name of your son jesus christ even though we're physically apart we are together in one mind united by the Holy Spirit in the bond of God as your body of believers. We come before you humbly because our present circumstances make it clear that this life which you blessed us with is just a whiff of smoke and that we continue to live and breathe on this earth only by your sustaining grace. And we thank you, Lord, for your sustaining grace. So we bow before you in humility this morning. We acknowledge that our lives are not our own, but that our lives are in your hands. And so we praise you, Lord. You are the most high God, and yet you are ever with us in the person of your Holy Spirit as we scramble around down on this earth here below. We praise you for the truth of your word. In you, we place our trust. We know that we could not live in this world without you, we could not be sustained without your truth. And we thank you for the assurance of being able to spend eternity with you. We thank you for your loving kindness, O Lord. And in your loving kindness, we're able to bring our petitions before you to lay out before you what we need to let you know that we rely totally on you. I would lift up Pastor Randy just now as he and his daughter prepare to take a long and arduous trip down from Boston. We know the, the rigors of the road these days, the, the dangers that exist. So we pray that you would just put your hand of protection on him and her, keep them in your loving care, and give them safe travel, safe passage back down to Hernando. And I would pray more for Pastor Randy that as we go through these trying times, the difficulties that have assailed him that none of us saw coming, certainly not he and his wife, that they're dealing with now, we pray that you will give both he and his wife strong assurance of your presence, of the presence of your Holy Spirit living in them, working in them. Give them your guidance. Give them strength. Give them comfort. Give them, again, assurance that you are there. We lift up to you, Lord, the people on the prayer list. None is more important than the other. They're all equal in your sight. So for all of those whose names are on the prayer list, we pray that you would touch them in a way that's most meaningful to them. You know their needs far better than we do. You know what we need, what you need to do for them. And so we just ask you that you will, that you will graciously touch them that you will touch them in a mighty and powerful way, bring comfort where comfort is needed, bring peace where peace is needed, and bring healing where healing is needed. We know that you are the great physician and that you know the needs, and we just ask that you will touch each one in a special way. And I pray for our country, Lord. Time of probably most, the most division we've experienced since the Civil War. Evil is afoot. Satan is having a wonderful time. But we know that you are God and that you are ultimately in control. So that we pray that you will keep us as a nation in the palm of your hand. Guide us. Be with us. Direct those of us who look to you. Keep us in your care and let us never forget that you are in charge. And I pray for our church, Lord, and its mission. Again, we're going through trying times, but we have very faithful people. We have people who care. We have people who are praying diligently, who are lifting up this church and its mission. So we pray that you will continue to undergird us, to strengthen us, to lead us out into the community to win souls for Christ. Because you put us here for a purpose. We strongly believe that. 
and we just ask you to direct us and guide us in that purpose so that we might do what we do for your glory. I would lift up to, Lord, those who have left our fellowship and gone elsewhere. They are your precious children, as we are. We know that you love them as much as you love us, and we are to love them too, and we do. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless them richly wherever they are in whatever decisions they make. But I pray that you would give them a sensitivity of spirit to your leading and to your guidance so that the decisions they make, the directions they go, will be according to your Holy Spirit and not according to some other force. So we acknowledge, Lord, that you are God, and we are not, that Jesus is Lord, the name before whom every knee shall bow and tongue confess at that final day. So be with us tonight, Lord, as we go through the service. I pray that the words that I am soon to speak, you will infuse with your power and meaning so that the people who are hearing might, might find meaning in them. And that we, I pray that whatever is said tonight will be fully and only to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Crystal and the musicians are going to sing one more song. I asked Crystal to sing this song because I was preparing this message last week when I came to church on Sunday and they sang and played, Holiness, Holiness is what I long for. And I thought, wow, that, that song is directly on point with the message that I want to bring this night, on Wednesday night. So I've asked them to sing it again, and I would ask you to prayerfully listen to the words because they feed directly into what it is that I would like to speak about this evening. Thank you.
Thank you, Crystal and friends. When the Lord brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and he had them at Mount Sinai, he literally laid down the law. He gave them the Ten Commandments, of course, we all aware of that, but then God spoke another particular message to the Israelites. In Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, we read that God said to Moses, Speak to the congregation of all of the sons of Israel and say to them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Peter wrote, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. And here, Peter uh, quoted back in Leviticus 19. So here's Peter in the New Testament quoting Leviticus in the Old Testament hundreds of years ago. So God's command for us to be holy, to live holy lives, runs from the earliest days of Israel as a nation when they were God's chosen people all the way through to the end of, of the New Testament, actually all the way through to the book of Revelation, which encompasses all of time here on earth. So in Leviticus and 1 Peter, we have simple, straightforward command to be holy because God is holy. Just boom, do it. But then we read in the book of Hebrews the same command, but with a negative consequence that attaches. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, we read, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Wow, doesn't that take things up a notch? From a simple command just to be holy to, if we're not holy, we will not see the Lord. It's one thing to be told to do something. It's something else again to be told to, do, to not do it carries a severe punishment with eternal consequences. One of the tenets, tenets of human life is that choices do have consequences. And the consequences for not obeying a particular command, this particular command, to be holy, are eternal in their ramifications. They make the difference between eternity in heaven and eternity apart from heaven. And we don't want to do eternity apart from heaven, in case you're not real sure about that. Mark Twain said that it ain't those parts of the, of the Bible that I can't understand that bothers me. It's the parts that I do understand. The scriptures we just read are pretty easy to understand. So I should expect that that call to live a holy life probably caused Mr. Twain a bit of bother. And I'm sure he was not alone. Probably bothers a whole lot of other people also. So I want to talk about that command. That command that carries a consequence. We are to live holy lives without which we will not see God. I know that you can read these scriptures or listen to them and say, what, me, holy? Do you know where I came from? Do you know all the things that I've done, the lies that I've told, the hatefulness, the sins, the offenses, maybe even the crimes that I got away with or not? Me, this is the person you want to be holy? No, no, all I want is just to go to heaven when I die. And I understand that, sort of been there, done that, and went through a period of that myself. It can be hard to know ourselves so well, where we have come from, where all the skeletons are, and then think, to our, think of ourselves in terms of being holy. But being holy isn't optional, we just read. As we just read from the scriptures, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And those are hard words. They mean that you don't just go to heaven when you die. We have a task that we need to be about while we're down here on earth. So let's take a look at this state of being called holiness. And let's start by defining our terms. First of all, let's take a look at what holy is not. Okay? Being holy is not like being wrapped up in some 
hooded flowing cloak that blazes in the daytime and glows in the dark. It doesn't make us all special so that people will look at us like some famous celebrity and say, ooh and ah, isn't she special, isn't she holy? That's not it at all. The definition of holy is actually quite simple. Let's go back to the Old Testament again. And just as an aside, a couple of years or so ago, John Leaf said something in a sermon about or to the effect that if you are neglecting the, whole, the Old Testament, you are missing out on more than half of God's message to you. Missing out on powerful truths and a deeper understanding of the scriptures and a deeper understanding of God. The Old Testament is a wide open window into the mind and the heart of God, and anyone can profit from that. John Leaf said that. Well said, John, well said. But back to our topic. Looking again back to the book of Leviticus, which you're probably not real familiar with, but it's a pretty fascinating book if you ever get the inclination. God was preparing his people, the Israelites, to go into the land of Canaan, the land that he had promised them several hundred years ago, earlier, several hundred years earlier, when he made his covenant with their father Abraham. And he gave them some rock-solid principles for living successfully in the land. He gave them laws. He gave them commands. Now, a critical part of those laws and commands was the command to utterly destroy the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, completely wipe them out. That seems pretty harsh, but that's how God wanted the Israelites to deal with these people because they embodied irredeemable sinfulness and wickedness. Sinfulness and wickedness that could not be redeemed. They were so far gone that God's only way of dealing with them, them was to wipe them off the face of the earth. If they were completely wiped out, then the Israelites and only the Israelites would live in the land and the Israelites would then be separated from the nations and consecrated to their Lord. So in Leviticus 20 verse 26, he said to them, thus you are to be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy. I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. So a big part of holiness is being set apart from the world around us to be holy the Lord's. And then we can't overlook the fact that we, as we're set apart, we are also set apart under the constraint of obedience. I like to say that the non-negotiable requirement for obedience flows out of the Garden of Eden like a river all the way down through the pages of scripture and history to the present. Because the command to obey is never canceled, it's never superseded, it's never rescinded. If we are to live a holy life in this world, we, even here in the 21st century, we need to be separate from this world and we need to obey God. Now, just one scripture to that effect, Jesus said, as recorded in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So obedience to the commands of Jesus is an, an indicator of whether we love him or not, but it's also a requirement. We, we need to be obedient. And the command to be holy, of course, doesn't mean that we have to be physically separated from the world. It means that we are not to live according to the ways the world lives, but instead we are to live according to the precepts and the commands of Jesus, which are so clearly spelled out in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And of course, and this is indispensable, we are only able to live a holy life as we live under the guidance of, or in the guidance of, and under the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit, we really can't do anything. We need to, we need to hang on to that thought. Now, it's not a, you heard it here first kind of newsflash, that today the Bible is under serious attack. A whole lot of people, denominations, and so-called ministries have chosen not to concern themselves with the Bible's command to be holy, or with the Bible's command to obey the Lord. Doesn't seem to be really an issue for a whole lot of so-called ministries out there. There are all manner of ministries and teachings out there that tell people ways to live their lives that have nothing to do with holiness, not even a concept. 
You can be sure they do use the Bible, but they twist the scriptures or they cherry pick verses and then reinterpret them in a way that will support whatever particular scam they happen to be promoting at the moment. We hear teacher, teachings that are called gospels by the people who promote them, but we find the name, we find the name and claim it gospel. God wants me to have a lot of really good stuff. And all I have to do is let God know exactly what, I, what it is that I want, claim it, and he'll provide it for me. God is sort of like a heavenly Santa Claus that he just can't wait to fulfill our Christmas wish list. That's the reason for his existence, to give me stuff. Name it and claim it. There's the prosperity gospel. God wants us to be wealthy, to prosper us financially. So that's where we need to focus our praying and our energies. It's how we are to interpret the Bible. We're to read the Bible in the context of God wants to give us money. So we twist, twist the scriptures and torture them accordingly so that we can read them in that context. There's the gospel of positivity. God just wants us to to be happy and he wants to bless us. One very famous and fabulously wealthy person who calls himself a preacher says that he preaches only positive messages, which he explains means that he never preaches about sin because sin is negative and everybody has so much negativity in their lives that he doesn't want them to experience negativity when they come to church or when they read one of his books, which can be purchased for just $29.95 at any of the usual outlets. Uh, preaching that heresy has made him a multimillionaire. And one that's really insidious, that's out there quite a bit, because what I do, I don't sleep real well, so sometimes in the night I'll wake up and I'll turn the TV on and I'll dial up these midnight preachers and I watch them just to renew my disgust. And they're preaching so much these days about sow your seed, sow your seed. Uh, typically, it's basically send your money to this particular televangelist as a seed, and then God will bless you with your harvest. He will bless you with more money, which now they're calling also your breakthrough. You'll get your breakthrough. And it's all based on greed on both parts. It's based on greed for the people who are on the television, and it's based on greed for the people who are reaching for their wallets. A few years back um, up in Maine, there was a fellow from Denver, name was Darren. He, he, is, he had a radio program he called Darren's Coffee Shop. And I quit listening to him when he said, God has told me that whatever you send to me, he will return to you tenfold. And he said the actual words. He said, if you send me $10, he'll send you 100. You send me 100, he'll send you 1,000. You send me 1,000, he'll send you 10,000. And that, I'm sure he made a lot of money off of that because people want that kind of thing. There's a market for it, and it's really straight out of the pit of hell, I think. And don't even get me started on the social justice gospel because that's a whole different thing. So as I said, the Bible is under attack on almost every front. The devil is a liar, he is the father of lies, and our culture and many of our churches are awash with his lies. You cannot turn on the TV or the radio without hearing lies, or I suppose go online, which I don't do a lot of. So we desperately need Bible reading and teaching and preaching with discernment that is founded in the truth. And we as Nazarenes firmly believe, to the extent that we say we know that we have rightly taken hold of the, of the truth of the Bible, in that we believe and teach that God requires us to be holy. That holiness, or that holiness, without which we will not see the Lord. That requirement of holiness is, to us, wholly scriptural, and it is an unchanging foundational truth of the Christian life. God requires holiness. That is the truth on which a meaningful life is built. And to flesh out the, the definition of holiness a little more, in addition to being set apart, holiness is a thoroughgoing righteousness, being inwardly righteous and whole in the sight of God and by the grace of God, and being thoroughly righteous and whole in our outward life, out there where the rubber meets the road, out there where people can see us. Holiness is godliness, being like God in our inward nature, in our heart, 
which takes in all of who we are. Our heart is really all of us. How do we do that? 2 Peter 1.3 tells us this, that God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Did you get that? God's divine power has given us everything that we need for holiness. God doesn't require what he doesn't provide. He alone makes it possible for us to be holy as he is holy. And holiness is what we Nazarenes call our doctrinal distinctive. Our belief in and our teaching of the requirement for holiness makes us distinct from most, uh, most other denominations. Basically, if it weren't for our doctrine of holiness, we really wouldn't have a reason to exist as a denomination. We'd be like most everyone else, but holiness is what sets us apart from the majority of other better known denominations. Now, I don't intend to do a deep dive into the doctrine of holiness tonight, because I expect that most of you would like to wrap this up before next Tuesday. But the doctrine of holiness is a rich and fertile ground. It's very fertile, very rich. One of the benefits of being retired is that I don't have to go to conferences anymore. You know how conferences are done these days. Uh, they're typically held to address a specific topic. The sponsors will rent a meeting hall and all the people will come together and gather in one place as a group but they will hold breakout sessions, breakout sessions that will relate generally to the overall topic of the conference, but that will also address specific needs or concerns or interests of people. If we were to host a conference on holiness, we could house, have, have breakout sessions on a lot of different topics, all of which are elements of holiness. We could have breakout sessions on what is grace, what is the fruit of the Spirit, what is God's love? God's love for us, our love for him, our love for our, our fellow man. What does it mean to love ourselves? What does it mean to go from glory to glory? What is purity? What is the relation of heart purity to Christian maturity? What does it really mean to be under grace and not under law? What about sin? The list goes on and on. Like I said, holiness is a rich and fertile doctrine. But the breakout session that I would like to briefly host tonight is the role that our mind plays in living a holy life, our mind. The Bible has a lot to say about our mind, about renewal, about knowledge, about wisdom, all of which result from exercising our thought processes, from putting our minds to use, from engaging our minds. One well-known scripture that speaks to that is Jesus' response to the question, what is the greatest commandment of the law? His response, as recorded in Matthew 22, 37, is, was, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Doesn't that kind of put the finger on the importance of our mind? There are a lot of other scriptures in the Bible, lots and lots of others about the mind, but probably the best known scripture about renewing our mind, transforming it from the carnal to the holy, would be Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm sure you all know this. Paul wrote to the people in the Roman church, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Then this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So if we have any hope of discerning or understanding what is the will of God for our lives, we have to engage our minds. That's a pretty powerful statement, actually. In two short verses, he calls out the requirement for sacrificial holiness, and also he calls out the need to renew, to have a transformed mind. And that goes along, I think, with what Pastor Andy's been teaching about, the transformed life. We, our life will never be transformed if we don't transform our mind. And God is right there willing to do it. He's willing to transform our mind for us. 
The carnal mind has to be renewed if holiness is to be possible. It needs to be healthy. It needs to be fully engaged. And because of the incarnation, the passion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our minds can be renewed, can be restored to health, and be made strong. And down through our Christian walk, the Bible encourages us, encourages us, challenges us, and exhorts us to engage our minds. And that can be hard to constantly engage our minds because we now live in a culture and a time in history when the role of the mind is being diminished. Critical, critical thinking is demonstrably no longer taught in our schools. Critical, independent thinking is not encouraged. In large part, and there are exceptions to this, of course, but in large part, students today are no longer taught how to think. Instead, they're taught what to think. They're taught what they need to know to pass a test. It's called teaching to the test, and it's going on. And we're hearing more and more in the media that they're not actually being taught so much as being indoctrinated into a particular school of thought, which really narrows the mind. Everything today seems to be about memorization, feelings, and having only opinions that can pass the test of political correctness. The new cancel culture is the most egregious censorship of independent thinking that we've ever seen since the times of Lenin, Mao Zedong, Castro, and all the rest of those guys. All that matters these days is that I feel good and that I get my way, and that nothing should be permitted to interrupt my good feelings and prohibit me from getting my way. That is your mind in a straitjacket. If that's the extent of your thought process, you have work to do. But to live a successful life of holiness, to walk hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, doesn't just happen. No one just oozes into the holy life. It takes decisive, critical thinking, self-awareness, and a strong and constant mental effort. It takes decisive, critical thinking. We can't let our guard down. I read one author recently who said that living the holy life is hard. It takes intense and directed energy. So why do we have to be strong and constant in our mental efforts and not let our guard down? Well, if we look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, Paul wrote this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the devil has schemes that he uses against us to defeat us. He has his methods, methods that are tried and true. The devil has a well thought through strategy and time honored, that is time honored and effective against us. He has a plan that works like a charm to minds that aren't prepared, that are not engaged, that are careless, or that are not aware of the danger. It's all about the mind. The devil has his methods and his schemes because he has a mind too. With his mind, he schemes against our minds. To understand this, we have to remember that we don't fight against his schemes and methods with visible or physical means. Ephesians 6.12 tells us that the struggle is not against flesh and blood. The struggle is mental. It's in our minds. And then Paul, in his second letters to the Corinthians, he took up that topic, but he addressed that struggle in the context of forgiveness. Very applicable here. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, But you who forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. You see, forgiveness takes place in our mind. Excuse me. And by refusing to forgive, by holding on to enmity or anger towards someone else, which the Corinthians were apparently doing, it opens the door for Satan to infiltrate our minds. That's one of his schemes, and it's effective. Paul wasn't ignorant of the devil's mind oriented strategy, strategy, but I'm fairly certain that most anybody we run into today probably are ignorant of the devil's mind oriented strategy. And that includes a whole lot of people in a whole lot of churches across our land. We know that as Christians, 
and as one aspect of living the holy life, we're called to be good stewards over all that God provides us. We typically think of stewardship in terms of our finances because it's a major deal for most of us, and we know that all that we have comes from God, and we need to be good stewards over them. But do we ever think of stewardship in terms of being a good steward over our mind? God has given us a tremendous resource, our ability to think, to be logical, to determine the best plan of action, to choose rationally. But do we ever think about thinking? Do we ever think about our thoughts? Do we ever hold our thoughts up to the light of day and critically analyze them? It's easy for Christians to slip into unbiblical ways of thinking. For instance, pettiness, worry about any number of things, fear of the future, anger at whatever target, or just anger in general, anxiety about work or family, health, contempt for others, gossip, scheming to advance ourselves. The list of non-biblical thinking is endless. Those who are in Christ, who are living the holy life, can and should think differently because we have the mind of Christ. It says so right there in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, but we have the mind of Christ. That's a powerful tool. How then, how then, excuse me, how then do we purposefully bring ourselves to think with the mind of Christ while we live in a world that continually bombards us with garbage thinking? Well, we first of all have to be aware of the problem. We have to know that it's going on. We have to be aware that it's a problem to allow our mind to be used as a landfill. Think about who you are allowing to dump garbage into your mind. We live in a really negative culture, so we'll have the problem every day of someone dumping their trash on us. A friend or acquaintance, an overheard conversation, gossip again, confrontation with someone can dump a, a fresh load of trash on us. Switch on the radio or the TV and boom, another load of nastiness. Or log on to social media. You pick the medium. Opportunities to ingest fresh garbage are endless. Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. I would turn that just a little bit and say that the unexamined thought life is not worth living. We need to think about our thoughts and analyze them. To be better stewards of our thought life, to work with the Holy Spirit to reshape the way we think, we need to examine how we think, and then, where necessary, we need to repent. Because remember, to repent, repent needs to, means to change our mind. So when we repent, we change our mind. We need to think in new ways. We need to examine our thoughts and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to just stop thinking in ways that don't align with the kingdom of God. We can take control of our thoughts with the power of the Holy Spirit as he gives us that power. God has given us the ability to choose. We need to be constantly on the alert for Satan-inspired thoughts and choose to think thoughts that promote holiness. But it's not enough just to stop thinking in garbage dump ways. Garbage dump thoughts need to be resisted, but they also need to be replaced. We need to replace them by thoughts that promote and enhance living the holy life. And a great way to have replacement thoughts at the ready is to memorize scripture. Now, I know for most of you out there, myself too, memorizing scripture is a little bit more difficult now than it used to be, but it's not impossible. It can be done if we apply our minds. Whoops, there we go again, apply our minds. One technique for memorizing is to keep some three by five cards handy, if they still make those, or have a note, notepad close at hand when you're reading the Bible and jot down scriptures that you find to be especially meaningful. Then go back and try to commit them to memory. There are, at least two way, there are at least two ways that memorized scripture empowers our mind. First, memorized scripture provides our mind with ready thoughts to think. When we reject those garbage thoughts, we can immediately replace them with a, with a, a scripture that's already in our mind. The bad thoughts have to be with good, so we need to have holy scriptural thoughts ready at hand. A second way that memorized scripture gives us power is that the world is that the word of God then resides in our mind. When we memorize scripture, it's imprinted on our mind and it is there. 
which the Holy Spirit can then immediately bring to our consciousness when we crucially need the mind of God. It's already in place. What better way for the Holy Spirit to communicate with us than with the Word of God that's already in our minds? I would consider that to be good, fellow, good stewardship, good stewardship over our minds. So don't be deceived. Being saved is not the end. It's really just the beginning. Don't think that being saved and sanctified makes you immune from the schemes of the devil. It doesn't. He by no means gives up easily. So let us constantly be aware of the need for and the blessing of the holy life and our responsibility to maintain that holy life. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, the holy, for they shall see God. And isn't that what we're ultimately living for, to see God? Crystal. I love how God puts things together, even when you don't know. I wasn't sure what uh, Hal's message was, but the song the Lord laid on my heart today was, When I Look Into Your Holiness. It just goes along good. I love how God works, don't you? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for making it possible for us, through the power of your Spirit, to appropriate the beauty of your holiness. We thank you for wanting us to live a holy life and making that possible. You are a good and wonderful God. We praise you. We thank you for everything. We honor your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>